I would like to welcome all the participants to this fourth webinar organized by BSH, that is Pakistan Society of Hematology. This time we have selected the topic of myeloproliferative neoplasm and we have invited experts from all over the globe. We are honored that all of you have spared your precious time. So among the panelists, we have Dr. Usman, uh, Muhammad Usman Sheikh, uh, the uh, leading hematologist of our country from our University Hospital, Karachi. We have our very own teacher, Major General Salim Ahmed, Hilal Imtiaz Military from National University of Medical Sciences. And last but not the least, we have Professor Serge Vistostek. He's Professor of Medicine and Hemoncologist at Leukemia Department of MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. We are very thankful that you have spent your time early in the morning in the US, sir. So, Serge, thank you very much. Be on board with us. We are starting with our first presentation. I would like to invite <coughs> Dr. Usman Sheikh from Arkhan University Hospital for throwing light over diagnostic work of ophorectrocytosis. Over to Dr. Usman. Okay, and thank I you, would Dr. Request, I would request all other participants to mute your mics. Thank you very much. Hope to have a great learning experience today. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marine. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes, wait here. Go on. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum to all my uh, colleagues, uh, as well as to as well as to Dr. Rostovic. And the topic which is assigned to me today is the diagnostic workup of erythrocytosis. So, first slide is related to my conflict conflict of interest, and I have no conflict of interest regarding this talk. So, uh, this is uh, these are the few outlines. Uh, which is related to my talk. First is the definition, followed by a one or two slide about the absolute erythrocytosis without high hemoglobin and hematocrit. Then I will come uh, to how to differentiate between false versus true polycythemias. And yes, in the false uh, uh, um, polycythemia, the patient usually have high hemoglobin hematocrit with normal RBC count. Similarly, uh, then I will going to discuss the true polycythemia, which again divided into three broad categories, which primary, secondary, and idiopathic, followed by some special situations which we receive as an inpatient concerns so with a, a, a patient with stroke or myocardial infarction or butt cherry or some extensive thrombosis with high hemoglobin and hematocrit, and these special uh, situations require a special uh, measures at that time. So, let's start from the definition. Number one, the, what is the definition of polycythemia? By definition, the polycythemia simply means a high hemoglobin and hematocrit when compared to reference range. So, when I uh, 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 when I see all these reference ranges, say for example, uh, as far as the WHO is concerned, in in 2016, they propose a hemoglobin of 16.5 in males and more than 16 grams in females. The uh, first reading in red, which I uh, uh, which I uh, write down here, is one of the study uh, from clinical uh, 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 clinical uh, chemistry laboratory medicine, which was published in 2002. Uh, the, in this study, they use all the instrument available at that time, including Sysmax, Cellline, uh, Coulter counter, all these uh, instruments, and hundreds of samples were run at that time, and that show that uh, the hemoglobin of 16.9 uh, in male and 14.8 in female. So uh, the second one is from our institute because as we are uh, uh, accredited from College of uh, Physician, uh, uh, sorry, uh, College of American Pathologists from uh, uh, CAP accredited. And one of the prerequisite of CAP is that, that we should uh, uh, develop our own reference ranges. And it is the ideal thing to do from the institutional perspective also and from our population perspective also. And we use uh, 120 sample at that time for, for both uh, male and female separately. And at that time, uh, almost five years back, we noted that 16.6 is the cutoff for male and 14.5 uh, is the cutoff of hemoglobin for female. Similarly, these are the other th uh, other readings of hematocrit from a, uh, from our institute as well as from the WHO. And WHO for polycythemia, 
labeled 49 percent in male and 48 percent in female. However, I am not come across any cutoff for RBC count as far as the WHO is concerned. And this is these are all institutional based. And in my institute, we use six million uh, RBC count uh, as a cutoff for male to label them as to have an absolute erythrocytosis. When as compared to female, where we we use a cutoff of 5.2 million. So this is what about the definition of high hemoglobin and hematocrit when we compare to reference ranges. Now this slide I took from Google Images, and this is a very basic slide which tell us almost 20-25 years back we used to do uh, pack cell volume or hematocrit in a small tube. We centrifuge that tube, and uh, we actually uh, 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 then with that centrifugation, what happened? Uh, after centrifugation, the uh, uh, it's actually separate out the cells from the plasma. However, it is important to know the hematocrit may be deceptive because it varies with the quantity of extracellular fruit. As we have seen, those patients who use diuretics or those who have a, a history of gastroenteritis, they actually uh, there is an over expansion of uh, RBC volume as we have seen in this last tube as compared to uh, plasma volume. So this is actually a false uh, polycythema one can say and once you replace this patient with good hydration uh, the hem hematocrit usually normalizes. So this is an important concept from the uh, uh, from the perspective of polycythemia. Now as I mentioned that we have seen few cases in our practice when there is an uh, we have seen absolute erythrocytosis with normal hemoglobin and hematocrit. Keeping in view our population which is approximately six to eight percent are thalassemia minor or thalassemia beta thalassemia carrier. So sometimes what happen? They as a compensation as a compensation to ongoing uh, a little bit of hemolysis, body responds it uh, uh, with increase in the RBC count with normal hemoglobin and hematocrit. We must we just need to reassure this patient, and we also advise for some genetic counseling. Rarely, rarely there are few case reports in which PRV with microcytic indices and marked erythrocytosis, erythrocytosis patient can present with these uh, findings. However, in, uh, in, uh, usually these patients either have uh, GI bleed or in case of female uh, patients usually have menorrhagia. So this is another small important concept. Now come to false polycythemia. That means high hemoglobin hematocrit with a normal RBC count or red cell mass. The other term which is used for this uh, condition are false polycythemia or spurious polycythemia or relative polycythemia or apparent polycythemia. What happened? There is a reduction in plasma volume as I mentioned in uh, in my previous slide. Uh, uh, reduction in plasma volume alone, even in the absence of an increased RBC mass. And it can cause relative polycythemia or basically hemoconcentration. As we have seen, luckily this year we are unable to see a number, uh, uh, un unable to see uh, cholera because most of the uh, people actually avoid eating out uh, because of the uh, COVID 19. The other thing which is important is we have seen and not uncommon in dengue fever with a high hemoglobin hematocrit. However, the mechanism is somewhat, somewhat different. And in that case, there is a third spacing uh, 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 which occur with this, uh, due to the pathogenesis of uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Similarly, those patients who are on diuretic usually have high hemoglobin hematocrit sometime. Now come to true or absolute polycythemia. So these high hemoglobin and hematocrit as well as high RBC count are actually the surrogate marker of uh, 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 surrogate marker of actual red cell mass in a person. These are just surrogate marker. These are not accurate, 100% accurate, but these are the surrogate marker. So HB and hematocrit measure, the measurement don't correlate directly with RCM. And there are few studies in a cohort of 31 male patient diagnosed with poly polycythemia vera with a hemoglobin of 18.5 gram, 35% had absolute erythrocytosis based on RCM measurement. In court of women with more than 16 gram uh, of hemoglobin, 63% had absolute erythrocytosis based on RCM measurement. So uh, it is important to know that it is not 100% whenever a patient have a high hemoglobin hematocrit usually have true 
increase in the red cell mass hematocrit somehow correlate better correlate better with uh, red cell mass compared to hemoglobin concentration and there are some cutoffs in these studies if someone have a hematocrit of more than 60 especially in males or 56 in females always reflex increase our uh, red cell mass that is 25% above normal predicted red cell mass estimation now what happened probably in the world over what happened previously till year 2005 we used to do red cell mass in patient with high hemoglobin hematocrit however after the there are two things two things happens one is the introduction of uh jack to mutation the other thing is the more vigilance uh, uh and uh, i can say the some of our federal agencies didn't allow that allows at that time to use to use this uh, uh, radioactive agent in the laboratory so with the passage of time world over what happened the facility for this test uh is just vanished and it is not that it is not i i uh, as far as i remember the facility of red cell mass estimation is not available in pakistan so now come to <clears throat> once patient is est uh, established to have or clinical parameters and history indicative of true polycythemia then we have to rule out one by one first is the primary polycythemia now primary polycythemia uh, as an internist most of these use synonymously or interchangeably with polycythemia rubra vera however there are few other con congenital or in inherited condition which may present it with primary polycythemia and as uh, 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 we have some postgraduate student also so uh, it is uh, good or nice to know from academic academic perspective what are the other few causes of primary polycythemia other than prv it is these these uh, congenital or inherited causes are rare and incidence is unknown in pakistan just one slide about it now in any young patient say for example if come to your clinic with a high hemoglobin hematocrit with absolute erythrocytosis with negative jack2 mutation or uh, then you can think of these two conditions one is erythropoietin receptor mutation and other one is the high affinity hemoglobin because both these condition are autosomal dominant so there is always a chance of a strong family history with high hemoglobin hematocrit however one or two thing can differentiate between these two condition one is erythropoietin level is usually low in Uh, erythropoietin receptor mutation as compared to high affinity hemoglobin similarly history of thrombosis in the family uh, 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 can be available and test to confirm uh, erythropoietin receptor mutation is a pcr based test whereas in case of high affinity hemoglobin we need p50 on abg hplc 20 to 25% cases can uh, pick this high affinity hemoglobin and in the end we again need pcr to establish these anom anomalies however we are not used to see many patient of e epo uh, e receptor mutation or high affinity hemo hemoglobins so this but it is nice to know from academic perspective now come to uh, polycythemia vera Uh, there are history symptoms and signs and there is an analysis of 1545 patient with who drive prv uh, in polycythemia vera collected by international working group however it is noted that most of these patient presented incidentally as we have seen in other uh, myeloperaphy disorder like cml however some of these patient presented with these symptoms of hyperviscosity that include headache giddiness visual disturbances and early satiety hypertension is noted in approximately 50% of these patient half of these patient pruritus is also very well established symptom which is noted in approximately 36% patient erythromelalgia mean there is a there are burning uh, sensation painful sensation in the extremities especially in the fingers which is noted in approximately 30% of these patient it is usually because of the uh, plated clumping and sometimes aspirin is uh, do wonderful job in this condition in approximately 36% patient uh, 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 revealed a splenomegaly on examination and approximately 20% patient presented with some sort of uh, 20 to 25% present with some sort of at the time of presentation with thrombosis either in the form of arterial venous and sometime very few patient have major hemorrhage 
in in that particular study the hemoglobin the median hemoglobin was 18.4 with a median hematocrit of 55% white cell count uh, uh, was noted in a range of 3000 to 172000 leukocytosis is noted in approximately 50% however it is worth mentioning that prv is associated with increased risk of thrombosis when patient have leukocytosis Pilated count with a median of four uh, lakh sixty six thousand ranges from seventy thousand to two twenty three lakh seventy thousand, and approximately fifteen percent of patient have some time uh, 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 mimic with uh, essential thrombocythemia. Approximately fifty fifty three percent have thrombocytosis. so once you are suspecting the polycythemia rubra vera i still believe in the clinical setting if we have the facility of oxygen saturation measurement if it is turn out to be normal and patient have erythrocytosis or increased hemoglobin hematocrit with splenomegaly that is almost diagnostic of prv and sometimes we have seen these patient in our clinics with splenomegaly until or otherwise erythrocytosis with splenomegaly is diagnostic sometime however it is worth mentioning as i mentioned really all three cell lines are increased not only in prv but also in early stages of cml essential thrombocythemia and primary myelofibrosis in that case we need to further delineate these patient on the basis of further investigation 20% patient as i mentioned presented with a stroke or myocardial infarction and these patient need urgent management on the basis of we can't wait in these patient we need to intervene then and there to decrease the high hemoglobin hematocrit and further uh, and to decrease the overall uh, uh, red cell mass similarly but carry syndrome is another mode of presentation and sometime gastroenterology we receive consult from gastroenterology now diagnostic criteria is very simple as far as the who right diagnostic criteria is concerned as i uh, uh, in this uh, i mentioned in the red uh, according to the who 16.5 hem uh, is the hemoglobin With a hematocrit rate of 49 in male and in female, 16 gram of hemoglobin with, with 48 percent of hematocrit. However, BCSH guideline, which uh, recently published in 2019, they have somehow a higher hematocrit, 52 percent and 48 percent respectively in male and female, followed or if available the red cell mass estimation along with mutation in JAK2. If uh, uh, if mutation JAK2 mutation turn out to be negative then there is a list of further investigation which uh, include low serum erythropoietin radiological evidence of splenomegaly need or need to be ha need to have need to feel leukocytosis thrombocytosis presence of acquired genetic abnormalities in uh, hematopoietic cells so these are the other criteria as far as the bcsh guideline is concerned however uh, high there is a very high sensitivity more than 97 to 98% and specific to 100% for jak2 mutation from other causes of increased hematocrit so it is easy to easy to perform nowadays it is widely available in all big cities of pakistan and almost always positive in prv it makes life easy for hematologists as well as for the patient because in the era of this inform uh, extensive extensive information Uh, uh, which is available on internet most of these patient are always worried about the malignant aspect of the disease so once you have a negative hemoglobin or a negative jak2 mutation you can safely say at least at least this patient uh, uh, don't have uh, polycythemia rubra vera now uh, uh, again there are some other mutations in prv which is in uh, in, in few studies turn out to be a Uh, with the passage of time uh, the importance will develop at that include that to asl1 dnmt3 cb cbl tp53 and others now these are common not only to uh, this uh, polycythemia vera but also with to, uh, with other type of myeloproliferative neoplasm and some are very common in uh, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and C especially cmml chronic myelomonocytic leukemia so in one study of 422 patient with polycythemia vera and essential uh, thrombocythemia defective dna repair gene expedi show a strong association with leukemic transformation similarly another uh, study uh, uh, we check 
22 genes in 53 patients with leukemic uh, with leukemic transformation after myeloid neoplasm it identified that mutation in some of the above genes say for example jak2 tat2 axl1 and idh1 and 2 and mpl is noted so it is uh, these uh, uh, defects till to date not included in the overall diagnostic worker however significant is not yet established but in near future we will see some of this mutation will be included in one of the diagnostic worker now come to second important diagnostic uh, model uh, diagnostic test which is serum erythropoietin now serum erythropoietin has got both pros and cons low serum erythropoietin is a minor criteria for polycythemia vera diagnosis for both uh, uh, pcsh guideline as well as uh, 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 who guidelines so however it is important to know that normal serum erythropoietin doesn't rule out polycythemia vera because 10 to 20% patient have normal erythropoietin level even with prv if erythropoietin is low or normal with negative jak2 mutation then we should ask for jak2 exon 12 mutation and we should also advise for bone marrow biopsy although bone marrow biopsy nowadays is a major criteria uh, in the uh, who uh, uh, in, a, in a in a who diagnostic criteria so one study of pbsd of uh, which was published in 1995 281 bone marrow examination was done and the most common finding was the absence of stenable iron which was noted in 94% of these patient cellularity varied from 36 to 100% with a mean of 82% there is a, uh, uh, there, there was an increase in mega karyocyte uh, number of mega karyocyte and amount of reticulin uh, 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 which was generally increased in these patient so this was about the diagnostic workup of polycythemia vera now as far as the true polycythemia is concerned uh, the second category is this uh, uh, is the secondary polycythemia or secondary erythrocytosis as far as secondary erythrocytosis is concerned it, it is more common than the other type of polycythemia and we all know the secondary polycythemia uh, uh, in the secondary poly polycythemia erythropoietin is usually high and especially in the hypoxia driven uh, condition such as chronic pulmonary disease that is, that is cop is patient with copd right to left cardiac shunt that is uh, congenital heart disease obesity with or without sleep apnea patient who are coming from a high altitude and in heavy smokers however approximately 20 to 25% patient who receive renal transplant also have increased number of rvc count and sometimes these patient refer to us for further management there is another category also a small one with autonomous production of erythropoietin from tumor like hepatocell carcinoma renal cell carcinoma hemangioblastoma and others now this is one study from uh, journal of internal medicine published in 2019 and it definitely show that secondary erythropoietin uh, uh, secondary erythrocytosis or secondary polycythemia uh, uh, is a very common diagnosis when a patient presented with high hemoglobin hematocrit and in this study approximately 51 uh, 51% uh, patient revealed increase in the uh, uh, revealed a uh, uh, secondary polycythemia in the bchh guideline uh, they mentioned that 20% patient uh, uh, with copd usually have uh, this uh, uh, secondary polycythemia 5 to 20% patient after develop uh, secondary polycythemia after renal transplant 16% after pancreatic renal transplant 5 to 10% with sleep apnea 5% of patient with who, who who are heavy smokers usually present with it 2 to 10% with hepatocellular carcinoma and patient who receive who are receiving testosterone therapy should be monitored for erythrocytosis so it is important to know a little bit about this copd patient congenital heart disease and renal transplant because sometime these patient refer to hematologists for the management of high hemoglobin and hematocrit and we need to know a little bit about it in detail 
from management perspective elevated erythropoietin level always prompt investigation for secondary causes of erythrocytosis and as i mentioned some are very evident and there is no need for further investigations as i mentioned in cases of copd and congenital heart disease however further approach can be tailor made according to symptoms to rule out the possibility of epo producing tumor and in autonomous uh, epo producing lesion ultrasound of abdomen is very helpful because sometimes renal cyst or hepatic cyst or hepato hepatocellular carcinoma may have uh, uh, this autonomous epo produ production now this is a big category once you rule out all the causes including the false polycythemia true polycythemia including prv and secondary polycythemia is uh, despite that a good number of patient fall in this category and in most of the studies it is approximately for 30 to 40% of these patient uh, belong to this category with with idiopathic erythrocytosis and in this case serum erythropoietin is not always helpful why because approximately in one third it is uh, the serum erythropoietin is normal and in approximately two third it is elevated it is probably an under diagnosed condition with some unknown pathology and management is also controversial however some physician prefer to keep hematocrit around 45% by advising felvotamic uh, the therapeutic felvotamides this is one slide in which in, uh, in 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 this study we can easily note there is a two group one is of uh, polycythemia vera another is the idiopathic erythrocytosis most of these patient usually have normal uh, erythropoietin level and uh, uh, similarly white cell and platelet count in most in in majority of these cases of idiopathic erythrocytosis are normal so in conclusion this is my last slide we have first to rule out the causes of false polycythemia and in our uh, 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 perspective in our uh, uh, considering the uh, our population with 6 to 8% thalassemia carrier rate we need to rule out rule out thalassemia uh, minor in our patient who presented with microcytic indices and increase in the uh, rbc count we need to check oxygen saturation in the clinic whenever a patient presented with high hemoglobin hematocrit in borderline high hemoglobin hematocrit cases i usually without uh, any evident cause i used to give advice to repeat a complete blood count after 4 uh, to 6 days of good hydration and in, um, in borderline cases it usually correct the defect in case of smokers repeat hemoglobin hematocrit after one week of cessation of smoking and again most of in most of these cases cases i note that the correction uh, the high hemoglobin and hematocrit become normalizes treat urgently in certain clinical situations say for example a patient presented with a hemoglobin of more than 20 g or hematocrit of more than 60 with a stroke or uh, with myocardial infarction we need uh, to intervene urgently and uh, the, these two tests are very important to rule out the possibility of that is jep2 mutation in serum erythropoietin to rule out the possibility of uh, 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 rule out the possibility of polycythemia rubra vera so dr marin thank you very much i hope that i finish in time thank you very much dr spanchek for sparing your precious time on friday evening here um we have a couple of question and answers which i can um deal with uh, in writing afterwards so moving to our uh, next presentation by janasree so i would like to invite my teacher and mentor professor salim ahmed khan uh, he is an eminent hematologist of the country he was a commandant armed forces institute of transfusion and he has also commanded Uh, a very prestigious institute that is army medical college he was principal at army medical college currently he is serving as pro vc national university of medical sciences that is nams he is a brilliant morphologist i must tell you that's why we have requested him to throw light upon diagnosis and risk stratification of essential thrombocytemia and primary myelohepatosis over to janesh singh sir thank you very much thank you everybody and uh, thank you very much madam
and I'm also thankful to, to PSH for inviting me in Jana Pervez. And uh, for the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'll be talking about the topic assigned to me, diagnosis and risk stratification of central thrombocythemia and primary myelofibrosis. Uh, Myeloproliferative neoplasms are clonal hemopoietic stem cell disorders characterized by proliferation of cells of one or more of the images, that is, diagnostic, erythroid, and megakaryocytic. Myeloproliferative neoplasms are rare because their incidence is lower than the 6 per, six per 100,000 persons per year. The term, these disorders were previously called myeloproliferative disorders. The term neoplasm was introduced in 2008 by the authors of the WHO classification of tumors and hemopoietic lymphoid tissues to highlight the clinical nature of myeloproliferative disorders. This is the 2000, in the 2016 review of the WHO classification, following categories of myeloproliferative neoplasms are listed. So there are about seven of them, and I'll be talking mostly about the ET and the primary myelofibrosis. Because of their overlapping features, uh, PV, ET, and primary myelofibrosis have been traditionally grouped into the category of Philadelphia negative classical myeloproliferative neoplasms. Smatic mutations in the three direct genes, that is JAK2, KRR, and MP, represent major diagnostic criteria for polycythemia, VIRA, ET, and primary myelofibrosis in combination with the hematological and morphological abnormalities. The bone marrow and the colorful blood film abnormalities are important. Now, coming to essential thrombocythemia, ET is a chronic myeloproliferative neoplasm that primarily involves the megakaryocytic lineage. It is characterized by sustained thrombocytosis in the peripheral blood and increased number of large, mature megakaryocytes in the bone marrow and clinically by the occurrence of thrombosis and or hemorrhage. The major type of thrombocytosis include reactive or secondary thrombocytosis, chronic myeloid neoplasm, and family or hereditary thrombocytosis. This is quite a busy slide, but I would like to make you focus on this slide. And uh, one thing I would like to emphasize that the key to the diagnosis of essential thrombocytosis is that you have to potentially diagnose it and rule out the scanning causes of uh, thrombocytosis, which are very more common than the clonal disorder. So, beside if you do the work of beside taking the family history, personal history, and also the physical examination, you have to make a platelet count. And if it is more than 40, you are born with a patient of thrombocytosis. Now, there are two types of tests. Once they call, one, uh, one they are called as the first line test, and another is the second line test. So within the first line test, there is a CVC count, which will show that the thrombocytosis also will give you indication about the hemoglobin and the TLC. And then you have to examine the peripheral blood smear, which gives you a lot of information. And in case of ET, it will show you increased number of platelets, as well as their size and pleomorphism. And then you have to make a CRP and body iron stones and BCR ABL1 rearrangement, JAK2, KLR, and MPL mutational states. So these, sorry. So these are the first line test you have to make in a patient of suspected thrombocytosis. So if there is iron deficiency uh, and or inflammatory states, uh, you have the, the we call reactive thrombocytosis and you have to be, it has to be evaluated after some period. And if the iron studies or the CRP is reflective of these iron deficiency states or the inflammatory states. And if you have JAK2 or KMA exon 9 index or MP exon 10 mutation positivity, the diagnosis of essential thrombocythemia is probable. But bone marrow biopsy, which is the second line test and a very important test, is required to confirm it. Now, bone marrow biopsy is part of the 2016 classification. And this is how to exclude other myeloplasm, that is, polycythemia vera, primary myelofibrosis, MDS or MDS MP and plasma with ring cytoblast and thrombocytosis. So this is the whole category which are the clinical disorders 
which comes into the differential diagnosis of essential thrombocytemia, and the others are the scanty disorders which come into the category of thrombocytosis. Okay, we were just trying to follow the algorithm for a diagnosis of thrombocytosis, and we talked about the iron deficiency and about the first line test, which ruled out the iron deficiency and inflammatory states. And then, if the uh, these viral genes are any one of the viral genes is positive, you are dealing with uh, essential thrombocytemia. And if these viral genes are absent, then these patients have no evidence of reactive thrombocytosis and are triple negative, that is negative for these mutations. These include cases of essential thrombocytemia associated with non-clinical somatic mutation of MPL. It means you have to look for another mutation or more mutations in this MPL or other genes, or you have to make a, a sequencing of the, or the extended sequencing to find out any other mutations. Or you are dealing with subjects with heredity thrombocytosis there are very nice situations which are having germline mutations of JAK2, MPL, or thrombopartine genes. Or still you are dealing with individuals who are having a non-clonal disorder. So this is a general algorithm which is uh, having the first line test and the second line bone marrow examination to rule out the reactive as well as the clonal disorders of thrombocytosis. See the uh, diagnostic criteria of 2016, the natural classification, we are all familiar with that. It's a major criteria where there's a patient count, then the bone marrow biopsy showing the typical megathymocytic lineage, which are mature and large with hyperlobulation and no left shift in the neutrophilic granulosis, and there is very minor fibrosis. And third is that you get to exclude the other disorders, and any one of this, JAK2, KLR, or MPL mutation has to be positive. And minor criteria is presence of other clinical markers beside these, or absence of evidence of reactive thrombocytosis. The diagnosis of ET requires that either all major criteria or the first three major criteria plus the minor criteria are met. 2016 review of WHO classification, the diagnostic criteria. But ET has been only slightly modified with the inclusion of KLR mutation. In addition, the WHO revised criteria highlighted the importance of two ET from prefibrotic primary myelofibrosis as these two entities have different clinical outcomes. Bone marrow biopsy is of fundamental importance to distinguish between these two conditions. This is the peripheral blood film showing a lot of. Uh, thrombocytes and then there are, if you make a bone marrow examination, you can see lakes of platelets and there are increased megakaryocytes who are mature, larger in size, having lobulation and what we call sometimes hyperlobated hyper or staghorn type of megakaryocytes. So actually the bone marrow megakaryocytic morphology holds the diagnosis of uh, ET and to make it differentiated also from the others. Now, most patients of ET are asymptomatic at diagnosis and thrombocytosis is typical incidental. The positivity of these uh, driver mutations are shown more for the JAK2 and less for the MPL. The detection of a driver mutation confirms the presence of a nucleus, but its absence does not rule out its possibility. So it's very important. It, their absence does not rule out the possibility of ET. And vascular complications are higher in JAK2 mutation than the KLR mutation and progression of myelin fibrosis in KLR mutation is more than the JAK2 mutation. So it means the mutations have a significant role in the outcome of the disease itself. So let's come to primary myelofibrosis, the clonal myeloproliferative nucleus characterized by a proliferation of predominantly abnormal megakaryocytes and granulocytes in the bone marrow, which is fully developed disease, is associated with reactive deposition of fibrous connective tissue and with extra medullary hematopoiesis. So this is a, is a uh, dynamics of disease process. Primary myelofibrosis has a systematic evolution. It starts from a pre-myelofibrotic stage, then moves into overt primary myelofibrosis, and then into advanced primary myelofibrosis. Symptomatology may be different. The grade of myelofibrosis, which you see, increases as the disease progresses and the pre myelofibrotic has a more better survival rate. That's why we need to differentiate it from the others. 
If we talk about pre-myelofibrotic, pre-fibrotic myelofibrosis, it's an early phase of myelofibrosis characterized by granulocytic and megacytic proliferation and lack of uh, reticulin fibrosis in bone marrow. In the 2016 WHO criteria, it's again a major criteria and a minor criteria. In the major criteria, there is, beside minimal fibrosis, there is ATP of the megakaryocytes, and you have to lose the other myel clonal disorders, and there is pre presence of two or one of these driver mutations. And in the minor criteria, you have to have anemia, not attributable to any other condition, leukocytosis, palpable splenomegaly, and a raised LDH. So the diagnosis of prefibrotic myelofibrosis requires meeting of all three major criteria and at least one minor criterion. It's very important to note that in the absence of any of the three major clonal mutations, the search for other frequent company mutations should be made. They are helpful in determining the clonal nature and as well as these mutations are very helpful in the risk stratification as well as prognosis and selection of therapy in some cases. Now, this is a table which helps you to differentiate between ET and pre myelofibrotic cases. And if you see, uh, the cellularity is usually normal, it's increased in cellularity, myelarthroid, myeloid ratio is increased in pre myelo pre uh, EMF, and then there are megakaryocytic clusters. They are rare, they are frequent. Megakaryocytes, uh, the size of the megakaryocyte is large, they are mature looking, forming loose clusters and they are lobulated, having, uh, having staghorn uh, lobulation. But in the primary pre-PMF, you have to see megakaryocytes which form uh, rather some ATPR, they will show it form some more dense clusters. And fibrosis is very rare, but sometimes it's more over here. This differentiation is important, and why this uh, it was made part of the 16 criteria of the why it was included as a separate entity because most of the and many of the pre PMF cases they present also with thrombocytosis. So, this is microscopy of the two disorders which I have already explained. This is pre fibrotic myofibrosis. And the other one is the essential thrombocytemia, rather mature and hyperpopulated, and there is more ballooning and clustering of the megakaryocytes. Diagnostic criteria of primary myelofibrosis, the upper fibrotic stage, is also given by the 2016 WHO classification divided into major criteria and the minor criteria. And the diagnosis depends upon all the major and at least one of the minor criteria. And if you see the major criteria, again, the focus is on the megakaryocytes forming dense clusters, showing more ATP, and the fibrosis that leads to collagen fibrosis and to the uh, sacrosis. So this is how the disease progresses, and rest of the criteria and measure are the same. And within the minor criteria, uh, there is at least one of the following here, leukocytosis, splenomegaly, and LDH, and leukoerythroblastosis. Now, besides having the clonal disorder of myelofibrosis, you have many of the, you come across in your practice seeing myelofibrosis in the bone marrow and many of the disorders which are reactive as well as they are not uh, primary myelofibrosis but some other clonal disorders. So there are uh, other MPNs having their fibrotic phase, CMML, megakaryocytic leukemia presents as acute myelofibrosis, then there are metastasis, lymphoid neoplasts, chemotherapy, toxins, infections, autoimmune disorders. So whenever you are trying to work up for a case of primary myelofibrosis, you have to keep into consideration all this uh, secondary causes or the non-myeloproliferative, non-other clonal disorders into your mind while making a work up for primary myelofibrosis. So this is the uh, picture which you see very characteristic of myelofibrosis, teardrop cells, and deeper is the blastic blood picture, the nucleated RBCs and immature WBCs, and some of the megakaryocytic fragments. So these are some microscopic depictions of proliferative phase of myelofibrosis, then the fibrotic phase, and there is progress to sclerotic phase of myelofibrosis, and you can see uh, intracytal hematopoiesis and extramedullary hematopoiesis, very, very characteristic of overt myelofibrosis. 
then if you see uh, grade uh, by, by using the uh, uh, by if you are looking for the fibrosis to see by the uh, silver staining if you see there is grade zero they, in this the fibers they are very thin fibers not intersecting in grade one the fibers are intersecting but they are not dense uh, densely concentrated in stage two there is dense intersection and some collagen fibrosis and sacchylosis is sitting in and okay. great because you have to uh, make decisions about your treatment and uh, you have to uh, make a longer follow-up for the patients as well there are many many uh, prognostic and risk stratification models which are in practice and i'll show you a few of them and for the et the most common is the european leukemia network recommendation which is based on age previous thrombosis bleeding and platelet count and it predicts the vascular complication for the patient. Low risk are the those who have none of them, and high risk is the one which has one out of the three. Then comes the Ipsit thrombosis. It is related more to the risk of development thrombosis. It also takes into account age, thrombosis history, and then comes the cardiovascular risk factors and JAK2 mutation. If you have a JAK2 mutation in ET, it predisposes you more to the thrombosis. Now next comes the IPSET International Scoring System to predict the overall survival. This is again age, previous thrombosis and leukocyte count. If you are low, if the score is zero, you have long-term survival and intermediate, you have one to two points, intermediate risk survival is 24 and the high risk, it's about 13.8 years. Now let's come to uh, risk stratification for primary myelofibrosis. There are various prognostic models that are currently used in clinical practice for, for this purpose, and they are formulated by International Working Group for Myeloproliferative Neoplasm uh, Research and treat, Treatment. So IPSS system, they take into account age, constitutional symptoms, hemoglobin, WBC count, circulating blast, having one score for each. This system, uh, estimate survival at the time of diagnosis. And in the second dips, the again, the uh, age constitution are the same. The two points are given to the hemoglobin and it's a more dynamic system. It can be applied anytime during the clinical course. The other is dips plus. It takes into account the dip scoring as well as RBC transfusion needs, platelet count and unfavorable carrier type. So this gives an additional points and this system can also be applied anytime during the clinical course. Primary myelofibrosis is an MPN of high genetic complexity characterized by various combinations of driver and cooperating mutations. Recent observations indicate that these mutations have an independent effect on overall survival and risk of leukemic transformation. In the last two years, mutations are part of three new prognostic systems in primary myelofibrosis MIP SS70, MIP SS70 Plus, version 20, and GIP SS. So these are the new prognostic systems and the risk stratification systems that are being used now. These include independent cost prognostic contribution of driver and other mutations, karyotype, and sex adjusted hemoglobin levels. MIP SS70 utilizes mutations and clinical variables. The other one utilizes mutations, karyotype, and clinical variables, and GIPSS is, basic, is based exclusively on mutations and karyotype. The new prognostic models are very valuable in therapeutic decision making and are useful for post transplant patients as well. So, let's, for to conclude, I would say it's now abundantly evident that, that genetic markers are playing an increasing role in the diagnosis and risk stratification. And these mutations, which are driver mutations, however, are not deep specific and their presence is not sent, is, is give you a lot of importance, but uh, as per the criteria, you can otherwise diagnose these disorders on the basis of morphology, which are, we have to be very, very, uh, very, very, I mean, we must know the morphological distance uh, differences and had to be very strong in the morphology of the bone marrow if we are diagnosing myeloproliferative neoplasm. Thank you, Mahin, and everybody. And I hope um, my voice has settled later down. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for putting all of us wiser.
It was an excellent presentation, and thank you very much for bearing with our interruptions. We interrupted you twice, and so I must tell you, your voice is much more audible and much more clearer without mic. Thank you very much. So moving on to our third and uh, last, but not the least, presentation by our guest speaker. I am um, honored to have Professor Dr. Serge Vestostik on board. He's the professor of medicine and hemoncologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. Uh, Dr. Vestostik is a global leader in myeloproliferative neoplasm and the founder and director of the largest MPN clinical research center worldwide. Dr. Rostovsik has achieved international acclaim for his leadership in developing landmark MPN therapeutics. Dr. V has uh, led uh, more than 60 early and advanced phase clinical trials, and uh, he has uh, of novel MPN drugs. He is, uh, has published 23 books, chapters, and more than 550 peer-reviewed original articles and reviews in leading medical journals like Blood, New, Journal, New England Journal of Medicine, and um, Lancet. Dr. V is the lead and senior author of over 80 and 200 articles. I had the honor of working with him at the Leukemia Department of MD Anderson Cancer Center, and he was guiding me throughout the clinics. Thank you very much, Dr. V. Serge, we are really thankful you spent your time early in the morning, and um, you'll be uh, putting us much more wiser for the management of myeloproliferative neoplasm. Over to Serge. It's a great honor and a pleasure to join you here today. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, share my experience with you. And I learned already a lot from your experience listening to prior speakers. Really a fun and enjoyable event. I hope that uh, my presentations, and I have about 45 minutes to present on management of MPNs, will be useful as well. And I'm looking forward to a quality discussion after that if we have time. Do you hear me well and do you see my slides? Yes, uh, your slides are really clear and your voice is also clear. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm really going to focus on, on management. We have heard about, uh, and just prior talk about the diagnostic uh, process and the prognostication. Uh, so we're going to talk first about ET, and then we're going to talk about PV, and then myelofibrosis. That's the task for today. And of course, there is less on the PV and ET, and there is much more on myelofibrosis just because the myelofibrosis is such a deadly condition and we worry about patient survival and we are trying to save their life basically. That's the reality. So let's talk about the easiest one first, thrombosis. Thrombosis risk assessment in patients with uh, ET is the way that we manage the patients. Life expectancy is close to normal. Usually people are diagnosed in 60s. The life expectancy compared to the the population of the patients or people without ET is about the same. I had this discussion yesterday with a fellow from Pakistan, actually, in my clinic. Uh, what happens in a patient who has a, a 45 years of age? Younger people have much better prognosis, actually, with ET than older. And it's also close to normal if you read the, the literature for people that are younger than 40. Uh, so that needs to be uh, understood. It's really good the, uh, prognosis. Now, in terms of prognostic factors for thrombosis, because the pro thrombosis is the leading cause of death, we have two factors, as you know from the history, age and thrombosis, which is described in this slide. This is so-called conventional model. And we, we give patients aspirin and cytoreductive therapy if they are high risk. And we have hydroxyurea, anagolite, or interferon. The only reason to worry about the platelets, and I'm going to emphasize this one more time a little bit later, the only reason to worry about the platelet number, particularly in a low-risk patient, is extreme thrombocytosis above million and a half when you have acquired von Willebrand factor deficiency, which leads to tendency to bleed. In that case, we advise people to stop the aspirin and consider, as this the quote of the many of the guidelines, consider lowering the platelets to eliminate need of bleeding, and that would be below a million with one of the cytoreductive therapy when the one will one factor efficiency goes away and you can restart the aspirin. Now, there are some changes here in prognostication and dividing the vision of the patients in different group, but I'd like to highlight this particular information one more time in terms of platelet number and risk of thrombosis, because I see in my own clinic and Dr. Khan knows that very well. 
a number of patients that come from the community setting, 45 year old with the platelets of a million, million and a hundred thousand on hydroxyurea. There is no need to treat the patients that are younger than 60 with site reductive therapy for the platelet number unless it is more than a million and a half. And in that case, you re treat the patients for the risk of bleeding. The study that I'm showing here, a randomized prospective study published in JCO two years ago, clearly documented that normalization of the platelets in the low risk patients, if they have platelets up to a million and a half, has no significance for that particular group of patients in any way. So it's just cosmetic control of the platelets. So I'm taking off a number of patients that come through the door that are younger than 60 with ET on hydroxyurea for control of the platelets numbers because the doctor in community setting believes that there is a connection with thrombosis if the platelets are a million or a million and 100,000 or any other number up to a million and a half. So I want to stress this very strongly here. Now, there is significant change in the prognostication of the thrombotic risk in ET. This is now endorsed by our own United States guideline that came up a couple of years ago. And we are adding another factor, as you can see on this table, the upper part will say that in addition to age thrombotic uh, history, we now add the presence or absence of JAK2V617F mutation as another factor. How does this in inform us what to do is in a lower part of the slide. So-called old low-risk patients, right? younger than 60, never had the thrombosis, are divided in two groups now, very low risk and low risk. So if you have, for example, a 45-year-old man who has ET and has a calreticulin mutation, never had a previous thrombosis, you may not need to give him aspirin at all. That's the question mark I put here. The guideline says consider not giving the aspirin because there is evidence that the aspirin in non jak 2 positive patients that are low risk has no value at all. It just increase risk of bleeding from the aspirin itself. And the high risk patients are divided intermediate to uh, and a high risk as you see in lower part of the slide. An example is again, let's say 65 year old gentleman who has never had a thrombotic risk and has a calreticulin mutation, so JAK2 negative, I am not giving them site reductive therapy anymore. Okay, so this is now endorsed by NCCN guidelines, by European Leukemia Net guidelines and uh, please consider this in your own practice. All right, the interferon obviously is acceptable alternative to hydroxyurea. This is pegylated interferon experience. On the left side, you have control of the blood cell count. It can be achieved in a high proportion of the patients. 76% have complete hematological response. At about 20% do not respond. This mirrors to great degree experience with hydroxyurea. Obviously, the attractive part to it is on the right side that you may see decrease in eject to a little burden, a little burden you can measure if you have the ability to do that, it will go down. But we do not advise to measure that. This is just part of the clinical study that is not decision-making point of uh, algorithm. It is about controlling the blood cell count and decreasing thrombotic risk with that control. It is only a question what the modification of the jak 2 little burden means for the patients and it's being explored pros prospectively in a number of studies. I'm mentioning interferon, peglet interferon to alpha 2A, which is Pegasus. We use it off-label because it's not approved because you know, and I will mention that, that in Europe, there was approval of another long-acting interferon called Ropeg interferon for PV and the owner, the company behind the ROPEG interferon is going to have a global study to study that particular interferon in ET, and we may have in the near future, uh, if it's successful, uh, approved long-acting interferon as therapy for ET. Time will tell. I'm just bringing this up for information sharing. I'm often asked, where is the role for ruxolitinib, a JAK inhibitor in ET, because it's not approved for ET. It has been studied by our colleagues around the globe in, in several different settings, and this is one that I like to show quite a bit. That's from UK, as you probably know, magic study in ET in a second line setting, where we have about, about the same response to best available therapy. Best available therapy was hydroxyurea, anaglide, or interferon after failing hydroxyurea, so many were rechallenged. 
In that setting, the control of blood cell count was about the same, but the ruxolitinib improved the quality of life. So this actually tells you where I go usually with uh, off-label use of ruxolitinib in ET setting. In advanced ET patients, when there are many symptoms and the counts are not controlled well, I try to optimize what I do with the conventional therapy, but that's not, if that's not possible, I'm trying to then prescribe ruxolitinib for control of those symptoms and the blood cell count uh, in a second line setting. Let's move on to polycythemia vera. Polycythemia vera management is summarized very uh, simply here. In upper part of the table, you see the two factors that are the same as in classical ET assessment, age and history of thrombosis. That would divide the patients in low risk, which you do not treat with cytoreductive therapy, just the phlebotomy and aspirin, and uh, high risk patients that you obviously we treat with cytoreductive therapy uh, and baby aspirin. So high risk patients and low risk patients are clearly defined and divided, but there are always exceptions for use of cytoreductive therapy in low risk patients, which is in the lower part of the slide. So I'm asked quite often in low risk patients, frequent phlebotomy requirement is listed as a reason to perhaps start with cytoreductive therapy. How often these phlebotomies need to happen for me to prescribe? No answer to that. It really has to be individualized and see whether the phlebotomies even cause some side effects. Uh, they do occasionally, but that's not very common. Severe disease-related symptoms can be present even when you have normal uh, hematocrit, normal meaning you phlebotomize very well. That's another example where I cannot give you the exact number how bad these symptoms need to be. Platelets, I talk about it, platelet number is not a risk factor for thrombosis. It's a risk factor for bleeding issues very high. And the last one appears to be the most important, progressive leukocytosis because white blood cell count, and I will show you that in a second, has been associated by many uh, as a factor for thrombosis. So progressive leukocytosis and progressive was put there on purpose is the indication to treat patients in a lower risk as well. Talking about the quality of life, just to highlight that we are busy physicians, hematologists, we don't have time to talk to patients much. Unfortunately, that's the reality. But if we do, we will figure it out that they are very symptomatic. This is difference in perception of symptom burden between the PV patient and the doctor that is seeing that patient that day. So what you have circled here on the left side, patients saying I'm symptomatic in 90% of the patients. The doctor on the right side at the same visit is asked whether the patient is symptomatic. Only 40% of the doctors will say the patient is symptomatic. Quite a discordance. Please ask patients questions, spend a little more time if possible to assess the quality of life. White blood cell count has been in many studies associated with risk of bleeding, but it's not full-fledged risk factors as of yet. This is one study showing, you can see from the left to right, the higher the white cell count, the higher the risk of thrombosis or higher the risk of incidence of thrombosis in a retrospective way. That's the key. Why the white blood cell count is not prognostic factor as of yet? Because all the studies from the past indicate it's uh, significant, but there is no prospective study that would say that normalization of white cell count makes any difference. So once we start cytoreductive therapy in PV, what do we want to achieve? These are the guidelines. As you see, hematocrit, we all agree on that. Less than 45%, I hope we agree on that. Without phlebotomy, and I'll spend a little time on that. Normalization of the platelets, the weakest point, because platelets do not correlate with thrombosis. White blood cell count, I agree with that. White cell count should be controlled if it's possible. And then number four and five, normal spleen size and disease-related symptoms, it's a quality of life issue. Just briefly, we, I think this is very well established. Controlling a hematocrit below 45% is very valuable because it decreases the risk of mortality and the incidence of major thrombosis. This is the probability of remaining event-free. The higher the red color, the higher uh, curved here is event-free for controlled hematocrit below 45. So a fewer events. And that leads to less of the mortality, right? Because the thrombotic risk is the leading cause of death. So the rate of death from cardiovascular event or major thrombosis is fourfold lower in patients that maintain hematocrit below 45%. The question is, once you start the cytoreductive therapy, should I aim, as the guideline says, to eliminate a need for phlebotomy or not? And so my answer is, I and I tried to do this in my own clinic. Yes, that's why the guidance are there. They're supported with the data. This is one of the data from Spain. 
they say if you are on hydroxyurea, the patient is on hydroxyurea, requiring three or more phlebotomies a year, as you see in orange color, then your risk of thrombosis is still too high. So in my own practice, I try to optimize hydroxyurea, eliminate need for phlebotomy, normalize the white cells, platelets if it's possible, and the spleen and symptoms. I look at all these factors. Now, interferon again has a role in PV as it has in ET. The same type of results as you can see on the right side, hematological response in three quarters of the patients. On the right side, decrease the inject to a little burden. So much so that after seven years of therapy, 20% have no detectable JAK2 by the uh, NGS testing that we use, about 3% sensitivity. Now, is this feasible to give long-term? That's the key. Unfortunately, the answer is no. I mean, long-term decades, right? So this is our own experience that I show. Effective therapy in a black box, hematological response in 80%, complete hematological response in three quarters, I just showed you that. But duration is about five years, right? Molecular response can be seen. That means decrease injective a little burden. The one that appears to be clinically relevant is only complete molecular response because only in that case, patients have a less of a risk of thrombosis or a less of a risk of transformation. But even in that case, it's not completely gone. What is the problem with the, the giving interferon long-term, pegulated interferon? Still continuation with toxicities, and discontinuation for toxicities and occasional failures. Now, in this setting, we are looking forward to widespread use of ROPEG interferon. ROPEG interferon is the one that uh, I mentioned earlier on. It's approved in Europe for PV. It doesn't say first line, second line, just for polycythemia vera. It has a name Bestremi. As uh, you see at the bottom of the slide, is indicated as monotherapy in adults for treatment of PV without symptomatic splenomegaly because the study did not have patients with symptomatic splenomegaly. It's a frontline study. In that setting, the goal of this therapy is as by European regulatory bodies to control blood cell count. That's it, CHR. And so I'm not gonna dwell on this much more, but one slide. How effective is ROPEC interferon and why was it approved? It was compared to hydroxyurea. This is the percent of responders as judged by CHR. In red color is the interferon part. In the uh, greenish blue, uh, gray color is the uh, control, which is hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is better at the beginning. As expected, interferon tries to work, but it takes time. And only later, after a year and a half, two years, interferon is superior. So it takes a little bit of time, uh, build up of the dose for the safety, for uh, tolerance, and then you get the better response than hydroxyurea long-term. That's why it was uh, approved and it does obviously control that thromboembolic risk and it does uh, lower the jack to a little burden. We'll see what does this actually mean long term. Moving on to uh, hydroxyurea failure. What do you do after hydroxyurea? You can use obviously interferon um, if, if it's possible. The definitions of the failure or intolerance to uh, hydroxyurea were developed on purpose to be uh, able to develop a drug for second line setting, which was ruxolitinib, as we all know. So what the definitions are, perhaps not absolutely applicable to everyday practice. These are four clinical studies, but if you just look at what they mean is in upper part in the blue color, not controlling the spleen or the blood cell count. That makes sense. In the lower part on the left side are toxicities, the most common toxicity is mucocutaneous toxicity, ulcers on the legs, uh, lower uh, part of the legs around ankles, and the, uh, the um, ulcers in the mouth. Nine out of 10 patients that have a toxicity are mucocutaneous toxicity. I'm uh, still puzzled that I see in consultations patients on hydria that have a big ulcer on the leg and the doctor does not know that that's common, most common nine out of 10 toxicity with hydroxyurea. And of course you have to stop the therapy. So the point here is on the right side that you should optimize the therapy and if with optimal therapy with hydroxyurea for a decent amount of time, you are not able to control the disease characteristics and then you change. And you change if uh, ruxolitinib is available to ruxolitinib. Again, you have that interferon as a possibility. Some use busulfan. These are all uh, medications mentioned in a guidelines. We here and in, in large part of the world can use ruxolitinib in a second line. In uh, the randomized study that led to its approval, that's the design of the study, it showed the benefits which are in a box at the bottom. 
compared to best value of therapy, which was hydroxyurea again in most of the patients because there was no alternative much to give. Some got the interferon, some got the lenalidomide, some got nothing. In that setting, it was superior to control the hematocrit, white blood cell count, splenomegaly symptoms, and there were fewer thrombotic events as one would expect on a safety analysis, and I'll show you that in a second. So there was another study called the RESPONSE study. This is in the middle of the slide. This was a copy of the study that I just showed, but the patients were mandated not to have splenomegaly. So the presence of splenomegaly in PV is not very common. If it's present, it may be symptomatic, but many patients don't have a spleen. So the question was, what is the activity of JAK inhibitor in patients that do not have a spleen? And it's about the same. You look at the first line in the table, hematocrit control, 62% control of hematocrit in patients without a spleen. If you follow the same line, 60% control in patients with spleen. Complete hematological response in a quarter, improvement in the symptoms about half by great degree. So spleen, yes or no, in PV doesn't really matter. If you are bound to use ruxolitinib JAK inhibitor in this setting, in a second line setting, these are the expectations, what you're gonna achieve uh, with uh, official response uh, criteria definitions. How long does this benefit last? It lasts very long. This was published a few months ago. The control of hematocrit after five years of therapy with uh, ruxolitinib is about 73%. Control of the spleen, if it's present, about 72%. These are the curves here. And then uh, the last uh, point here that uh, I want to mention uh, is the control of that thrombolic or thromboembolic uh, risk. This was not the goal of the study. So what I'm showing here is safety analysis, just telling us how safe that drug is. And of course, it looked at the thromboembolic events. So in a red box is uh, the number of events in the ruxolitinib at the beginning, then in the best available therapy. And then the last two numbers are uh, patients that crossed over from best available therapy to ruxolitinib. And on a face value on of the numbers and percentages, no p-values here because it's safety analysis, it appears that ruxolitinib actually is lowering that thromboembolic risk because obviously it's controlling their blood cell count much better than BAT arm. So it all follows the same story. It's valuable therapy in a second line setting. The last uh, point on the ruxolitinib is that unexpectedly, and we don't really ex explain this very well, I don't know the reason, is that in people who are iron deficient, and almost all the PV patients become iron deficient, some may have a symptoms from iron deficiency, the iron factors normalize. What I'm showing here on the left side, MCV, between the two shaded area is normal range, and in green color are patients on ruxolitinib without iron deficiency, I'm sorry, without iron supplementation, the MCV normalizes, you can look at them in the middle graph, the green color on the ruxolitinib, the iron levels normalize, and the ferritin normalizes. We don't really know how and why, but within three to six months, iron measurements normalize when people are given ruxolitinib. Moving on to myelofibrosis. We learn about two types, early prim or primary myelofibrosis, which is prefibrotic myelofibrosis on the left side and then overt or fibrotic myelofibrosis, which we usually think about when we talk about myelofibrosis, which is also the one that uh, includes post-ET or post-PV myelofibrosis. This is on the, on the right side. I'm gonna spend just a minute or two on the early prefibrotic myelofibrosis because there is a lot of confusion about what does this mean. And I try to simplify things as you can see. So I'm gonna talk about this on the next slide, but Already you can see what is the main problem with early prefibrotic myelofibrosis. It is the vascular events. These people have usually high platelets, right? They were carved out of the traditionally ET patients and said, no, you don't have ET, you have early prefibrotic myelofibrosis. So there you have high counts and they have a problem with vascular events more so than with anything else. We're gonna uh, just spend one slide here on early prefibrotic myelofibrosis because I wanna make point here that this is not so aggressive neoplasm, okay? This is the paper that uh, is the best one uh, in terms of explaining the outcome of these people. This is on the left side, overall survival. Uh, the uh, more than a thousand patients with ET were uh, reanalyzed and about 20% of them were said not to have ET, that they were said to have early prefibrotic myelofibrosis, which is fine. Look at the outcome. The ET patients appear to have 
uh, the best outcome. And when you compare to normal historical control of uh, healthy people, it's about the same. So no effect on the survival. What the early prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients experience is uh, the average survival of about 15 to 17 years. Now, 15 is my lucky number today for this slide. It's a 15 years of average survival. What is the risk of transformation to fibrotic myelofibrosis? Right upper part, 15 years, 15% 15 risk of prefibrotic myelofibrosis to become fibrotic. What about the transformation to acute myeloleukemia after 15 years, 10%. Okay, so very easy to explain to a patient. Many patients come through the door and say, I have prefibrotic myelofibrosis. I'm gonna be dead in five years. What do I do? I say, not so. The average survival is 15 years or more. Risk of transformation to fibrotic myelofibrosis, 15 years, 15%, and to acute myeloleukemia at 15 years is 10%. So we treat as ET, we prognosticate as ET, and we say that yes, you have perhaps a little bit shorter life expectancy, but you don't need to do the transplant tomorrow because you're not gonna be dead in five to seven years. With the, a fibrotic myelofibrosis situation is different, right? We have an average survival of five to seven years. We heard about prognostication. Prognostication is done to refer the patient to the transplant. The NCCN guidelines, United States guidelines were simplified recently to combine the intermediate one and the low risk together in a lower risk because the management is about the same. And intermediate two and high risk by historical IPSS prognostic scoring system into higher risk. And we heard about what prognostic uh, scoring system to use, but the main goal is to identify patients that have a life expectancy less than five years, which then are subject to transplant, as you can see. By now, I'm sure that you look through all of this. Lower risk asymptomatic observation. We don't have a clinical trials. Clinical trials in this setting would be to prevent progression. We don't have those. If they are symptomatic, regardless of the risk of dying, we will be using ruxolitinib for symptoms, Interferon or hydria are reserved for proliferative nature of the disease in this setting. High platelets, high white blood cell count, they are not useful for spleen or general systemic symptoms. That's the distinction between the two, three options here. In a lower part, you see ruxolitinib or in United States, fedratinib, I'll briefly mention that, as an option uh, for high risk disease patients. And of course, then you have anemia drugs uh, for, uh, even combination with the JAK inhibitors to help patients in all the three aspects. And the three main aspects are a spleen, quality of life, and anemia when we come to treating patients. So to simplify and move on from the, the algorithms, this is a useful table. And, and the title I like this way, once we are done with prognostication, then we look at the clinical needs, right? And we say, what is the problem? Anemia, you have a drugs here for anemia. None of these approved, but useful. Standard practice, nothing new. For symptomatic splenomegaly, now in the United States, we have fedratinib in addition to ruxolitinib. You see down the table where are the changes, ruxolitinib, fedratinib here, and ruxolitinib can extend the life for three years on average. It's on a label for its use in the United States. I understand it's not supported by any other label around the globe, but that's the fact, and I'll show you about that. So one factor here is the use of the questionnaire to assess the quality of life. If we say that the three main problems are that are uh, that led us to initiate the therapy, general quality of life, symptomatic splenomegaly, and anemia, then MPN10, which can be printed for, uh, from online source, is something that should be used, and we use it in our own practice, to assess that quality of life. We have to objectivize it. We have 10 questions, each from 0 to 10, so 100 points. And typically, we would say if any of these 10 is five or more, so 50% or more, or five or more on scale from zero to 10, that's a bad enough to treat the patients. Or if the total score is 10 or more, that's bad enough quality of life to treat for quality of life purposes. What does ruxolitinib do? The same for fedratinib, decrease the spleen and improve quality of life. Uh, how often does the spleen goes down? This is a waterfall, each vertical line is one patient, normalized uh, from zero, which is baseline spleen size, going down is improvement. You see that almost everybody has a degree of a spleen improvement. So I would say primary refractory patients are about 5% that don't have much of a benefit at all. But everybody else has a degree of a spleen reduction, which is tied to improvement in quality of life. And the, 
one of my patient's pictures are shown here on the right side. You can appreciate what's happening here. But there are three factors on those photos. Not only that the spleen becomes smaller, you can see the change in the uh, ribs. Ribs are seen in upper photo and they're not seen in lower photo because the patient gain weight. So quality of life improvements includes the weight gain, as you probably know from your own practice, ability to walk. And this patient, when uh, first seen, was in wheelchair in a second follow-up after a few months, was walking normally. And the third factor here is the timing of that benefit. It has to be, the therapy has to be optimized during the first few months to get this benefit. After two months of therapy in these photos, that's the key for success. Not only that we can appreciate the benefit, but it has to be put in context of when. It is usually during the first few months of therapy. Another factor that is coming up as important is the timing of introduction of therapy. Here is a, a summary of the study, JUMP study, in more than 2,000 patients that did include patients with low, intermediate 1 and 2 and high risk uh, because the initial studies were only focused on intermediate 2 and high risk. And what I'm showing is the spleen response based on a risk of dying. I already told you I don't really like that separation, but it's very useful for what I'm going to talk about. And that is the, the degree of a, a spleen response. Degree of spleen response appear every point of time analysis to be much better, as you can see from left to right, for patients with a lower or intermediate one risk disease. Why is that? Why would that be the case? Because the lower risk patients receive higher starting dose. Why? Because they have less of thrombocytopenia and less of anemia. So they can receive the higher starting dose of ruxolitinib, which leads to better spleen response. If you compare the comfort study results, which were intermediate to and high risk patients, to three studies that had intermediate one risk patients, you will see spleen responses are better in the earlier stage patients. There is less of anemia, less thrombocytopenia, clinically relevant anemia, thrombocytopenia, less of infections and less of discontinuation. Now, why am I talking about the spleen response as being important? Because it has been tied in all the studies so far with the degree of improvement of uh, longevity. This is from Italy, from common practice in Italy. Overall survival on the left side by spleen response at six months, the spleen responders have a longer survival. Durability of spleen response on the right side, better the spleen response, the longer it lasts. Therefore, my goal in my uh, practice is not to be shy of starting therapy when patients are symptomatic. Symptoms are the key, but and then not to delay the introduction of the therapy and to treat with the maximum safe dose. This is analysis of the correlation between the spleen response and survival from the comfort studies. Upper part is correlation with the, a percentage decrease in a spleen from 10 to 20, 25 to 35, 35 to 50, more than 50. For each 10% reduction from basal in the spleen length at week 24, again, the timeline is the first six months. Each 10% reduction from basal in the spleen length led to 9% reduction in the risk of death. So people live longer, the smaller the spleen becomes. And that is the survival benefit, one of my patients, again, at presentation and seven years later, that's what you can achieve with optimal management of the patients. Now, this dosing of ruxolitinib is the key. Here on the left side is a correlation between the dose and the spleen volume response. Clearly, you can see the higher the dose, the better the spleen response. On the right side is the total symptom score, so quality of life improvements. Here, we do not need higher dose. 10 milligrams twice a day is the maximum dose needed for feeling good, but it's not good enough for the spleen. So what happens in the United States, quite often people start with 10 milligrams twice a day, and stay at 10. They don't want to go higher. They start, first of all, low to avoid any myelosuppression. The higher the dose, the more of myelosuppression. But they start at 10. They have excellent quality of life improvement. You don't go up. The spleen is OK responding, but not optimally. And it doesn't last that long. And of course, the survival is not optimally derived as well. So my message usually is avoid starting with low dose. Go by the lever. If you start low, escalate quickly to maximum safe dose because uh, that will benefit the patients not only in the quality of life and the spleen to the degree, but also prolonged survival. And the doses less than 10 minutes twice a day are not effective long term. Now, the one paper that is outstanding, and it, uh, if anything from these presentations that is of significance, this is the one that will summarize everything they said so far. 
please take a look, Palandri Onco Target 2017, which with the data, supported with the data in that paper, will describe what I said just now, the influence of disease stage and quality of response and the influence of ruxolitinib dose. So earlier intervention with a higher dose will benefit everybody. Now, we worry about the myelosuppression. So what do we do in our own practice? Platelets go down, there are guidelines how to adjust the dose on platelets. Hemoglobin goes down, there are no guidelines on how to adjust the dose for, for anemia, but people usually use low dose or cut back the dose quite uh, a bit immediately if the anemia develops. Look at the hemoglobin curve, it goes down, but then there is a rebound. Well, for several reasons. One, there is a natural rebound, which we cannot explain even without those adjustments. That's one obvious factor. The other factor in this particular curve is people, they reduce the dose. The number three is what I do in my own practice is combined with the anemia drug. I already alluded to that. So if the patient is anemic uh, already, or we are seeing anemia developing on ruxolitinib, we would add anemia drug. We look at erythropoietin level. If it's below 125 million units, we would, we're gonna do the erythropoietin injections. If it's not, if it's very high, then danazole, uh, we also try thalidomide, 50 milligrams sometimes, it may work as well. And we don't want to cut the dose right away or under those patients because I want that spleen to become as small as possible during the first six months. If you are worried about the myelosuppression, there is alternative. There is alternative. This was a poster at a European Hematology Association meeting uh, last year. Alternative ruxolitinib dosing regimen where you do start with 10 milligrams twice a day, but then you go up. So alternative dosing regimen can be alternative to your worry or my worry that I'm going to worsen already present anemia or increase the frequency of transfusions. Look what happens. You got with 10, then you go to 15, then you go to 20 if you need. And with that approach, you may have 56% response rate. So it's not uh, trivial. It, uh, it, I can say at least as good as with uh, the alternative way of giving high dose at the beginning and then decreasing. So Many of my colleagues here are endorsing this type of approach. 10 milligrams twice a day, but then you have to go up if you can in a safe way to go to 15 to 20 to 25 twice a day, and it's always twice a day to get best out of it for survival of the benefit. And this is the hemoglobin over time with this particular approach. So, to, so consider this particular approach uh, if there is a concern about myelosuppression with the standard dosing regimen. So how I use ruxolitinib in myelofibrosis indicated for splenomegaly or symptoms regardless of risk of dying. Anemia is not contraindication. If it develops, I manage it as I described. I try to maintain patients at the maximum tolerated dose or maximum safe dose and early to get the spleen as small as possible to get that survival benefit out there for all my patients, not only selective. Something that I did not talk much about is the, are the last three bullets. Avoid abrupt interruption of ruxolitinib. I think that's very well known, but there are no guidelines exactly how to manage a situation where you need to stop it. At the European Hematology Association meeting three months ago, there was a summary from Italian experience which said people do a, a lot of different things and there was no uniformity whatsoever. We would be tapering ruxolitinib slowly by five milligrams every five to 10 days. And then also consider using prednisone as has been published uh, to counteract the rebound in the symptoms. That obviously is a worry in patients where you have to stop when the patient is responding to ruxolitinib. If there is absolutely no benefit to ruxolitinib anymore in any point, then you can just stop it uh, and that is, that's fine. But if there is a benefit to it, but you have to stop it, taper it and consider giving steroids if there are any return of the symptoms before you start something else. The last one, be aware of a rare possibility of opportunic infections, herpetic infections, particularly in 5% of the patients. We screen patients for the hepatitis. In some parts of the world, uh, it's necessary to look at the TB because the reactivation of TB or hepatitis have been described. Other opportunistic infections are extremely rare, but noticed. And monitor for skin cancer. That comes from the PV studies of ruxolitinib people who were on a long-term hydroxyurea that increased the risk of skin cancer itself, when switched to uh, ruxolitinib may have also uh, increased risk of skin cancer and I send my patients like that to a skin doctor for surveillance. Let's talk briefly about fedratinib. Fedratinib is not available outside the United States, but it may become. 
So just briefly, what happened with this, this is a study done many years ago. Pedratinib is now approved for intermediate 2 and high risk myeloid fibrosis, where uh, the study uh, was comparing Fedratinib 500 milligrams, 400 milligrams, or placebo uh, over a period of time. And the dose that is now approved is 400 milligrams a day. That's a daily because the half-life is uh, much longer than ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib always have to be given twice a day. Fedratinib achieves a 37% response in a spleen, 40% in the symptoms, so about the same as ruxolitinib. The difference is really in the safety. One needs to uh, measure timing level because uh, the fedratinib appears to be interfering with the timing uptake in the GI tract, which may lead with sporadic, very rare, vernic encephalopathy, uh, that is neurological, central neurological toxicity. So you need to measure it and make sure the patient is not time deficient and supplement timing during the therapy if necessary. It may also, that's at the bottom of the slide, cause diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting in a two-thirds to three-quarters of the patient's lower grade, but that really requires anti-nausea medications or anti-diarrheals. Now, the, the, uh, the fedratinib has been studied in the setting of uh, ruxolitinib failure, and to summarize this uh, slide, this was not uh, specifically approved for, but we utilize it, uh, uh, we do utilize the fedratinib in the setting after ruxolitinib in the United States because of the study that was published in March this year showing that 30% uh, of the patients, I'm circling this with my mouse, uh, uh, and the 27% response rate in the symptoms can be seen after ruxolitinib. The indication for its use in the United States is just for mild fibrosis. It is being studied, this is on the right side, in two studies, freedom studies, that are meant to really prove that fedratinib is, a value, uh, is a effective therapy after ruxolitinib, and maybe then the label for its use may uh, be changed in the United States, and maybe fedratinib will be approved in other parts of the globe for ruxolitinib failures. So these studies are underway. What can you do after ruxolitinib failure? Not really much. Fedratinib is not available around the globe. Standard practice, best available therapy medications don't really work. We highly, highly advise to enroll patients in any study uh, to benefit them possibly because best available therapy does not really work well. You can consider rechallenging patients with ruxolitinib after a few weeks of being off. Uh, what I'm showing is the spleen reduction from zero going down the same way as before. The blue color is initial a challenge with the ruxolitinib. Green is second time, and the, some patients even rechallenged a third time. That's possible because the loss of a sensitivity to ruxolitinib is not really, in most of the patients, uh, tied to any genetic abnormalities or anything like that. It can be then uh, postulated, and you can see from the experience here that patients can be sensitive again. And so that's one option in a second line. If uh, you use best available therapy and there are no clinical studies, you don't know what else to do, rechallenging is a possibility. Some patients, about 20 to 25 percent of the patients, progress to acute myeloid leukemia. That's the single most common cause of death, but uh, 80 percent die from complications of myeloid fibrosis itself. That's why I spend a little bit less time on the uh, acute myeloid leukemia part, but here there is a quite a change as well over the last couple of years. You will now see that after uh, detecting an elevated blast in blood or bone marrow, we would say the patient is either in accelerated phase, 10 to 19% blast, or a blastic phase, 20% or more, which is AML. But we would be treating these people e the same way. So it's not only treating patients when they're in acute myeloid leukemia phase. We treat everybody who has 10% or more accelerated phase with the same approach as if they were in uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And so what would you do if there is a possibility of transplant? We would induce remission with hypomethylation agents as a standard practice for two or three months. And if that doesn't work, we would do then, only then, intensive induction chemotherapy followed by the transplant. Most of people are older and sick, not the transplant candidates. Therefore, we utilize what is on the right lower part, clinical trial, or hypomethylation agents, or a low intensity induction chemotherapy. Cladribine low dose RSC, for example, or low dose RSC sub Q alone, or cladribine alone. Hypomethylation agents became a standard practice. In that setting, we still use ruxolitinib to control spinomegaly and systemic symptoms. We don't 
cut back on that benefit. We utilize this uh, ruxolitinib at 10 milligrams twice a day and let it be like this without any change because the change will be due in blood cell count due to other therapies. So we kind of fixed on a 10 milligrams twice a day ruxolitinib in combination with HMAs or chemotherapy for control of spleen and symptoms and we will not interrupt the therapy even if the platelets go down due to HMAs or chemotherapy. So where are we going from here? If we have uh, JAK inhibitors approved, ruxolitinib for malofibrosis and fedratinib in United States approved as well. We have other studies with JAK inhibitors underway. Fedratinib, I told you that there are studies to really have it approved as a second line choice. There are other two JAK inhibitors that are being developed. One, momelotinib in second line setting for symptom and anemia benefit. That drug appears to be a little bit different than other JAK inhibitors, possibly improving anemia. So the the developmental part uh, of the, its uh, attempt to be approved has been changed to control of symptoms and anemia instead of symptoms and a spleen. Pacritinib is being developed as a choice for patients with platelets below 50, where we hardly ever use uh, fedratinib or ruxolitinib. We do occasionally at a very low dose, but this is an uh, area of, uh, of medical need. Other medical uh, studies or other clinical studies are being done Many are combining JAK inhibitors with something else. If you go from the top, you see hypomethylation agents in combination. That became already standard practice, as I said, for accelerated blastic phase. Then the anemia drugs. Anemia is usually a very big problem. And then other medications being combined to improve the spleen and symptoms control on top of ruxolitinib, basically, at this time. Most of the studies underway are combination studies at the moment around the globe. But there are many other drugs that are being tested as a single agent in a second line setting. And I'll just give you a flavor of uh, what else are we doing in terms of targeting different aspects of the disease. It is not only about inhibition of the JAKSTAT pathway anymore, which is underlying biological problem. We have here MDM2 inhibitor, LSD1 inhibitor, BET inhibitors. You see a number of epigenetic modifiers and all kinds of different other targets that are known to be part of the pathobiology of MPN and are being targeted with these new agents. So I thank you so much and I hope that I use my time wisely for you to learn from my experience and I'm looking forward to a lovely discussion with everybody online. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Serge. It was such a beautiful, detailed presentation of management of MPN, at least I learned a lot and I think everybody on board learned a lot. It would be very useful in our clinics. I have, um, and it would definitely help the Pakistani patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. So I have a few questions. Um, first is my own question. Um, the pre, uh, myelofibro, primary myelofibrosis transforming into AML. Uh, what experience do you have with HME alone to uh, get them into remission before transplant? Which percentage go into so the remission only with hypomethylating agent? Yeah, that's a very good question because you would say, what's the uh, comparison between the utili utilization of hypomethylation agents versus induction chemotherapy or uh, some kind of a low dose uh, chemotherapy regimen? And it's about the same. That uh, If you look at the review articles uh, and uh, experience, of course, the HMA experience is uh, smaller than with the induction chemotherapy, but achieving the CR is about 25 to 35% with the HMAs, whereas maybe 35 to 45% with the induction chemotherapy. So maybe a little bit difference between the two. However, if you add uh, the JAK inhibitor to either, you will improve the quality of life, and with the hypermethylation agents, you will keep the patients outside the hospital. Out, that's a quality of life issue. It's easier, it's not very aggressive on the patient's body, and then uh, you avoid complications from uh, intensive chemotherapy that even if you have a response may preclude patients from going to the transplant. Remember, the ultimate goal is to get to the transplant. So we consider, and that's why NCCN guidelines are written in that way, that hypermethylation agents have that balance between the efficacy and safety uh, in a best possible way to get the patients to the transplant, uh, which is ultimate goal. The, you should also consider that we are not really aiming for CR. Uh, we are aiming to decrease the blast be below 10%, back to chronic phase. 
which is a higher percentage. I usually say 50-50 chance to decrease the blast below 10%. That's from our own experience and, some, and publications from our center. And if you look a little bit more carefully and you are not so harsh on yourself, CR or else, if you just talk about benefit, which is decreasing the blast below 10%, when a my transplanter will go forward with the transplant, because that's a sign of a response, then it's 50-50 chance. Thank you very much. And how do you compare the combination of hypomethylating agent with JAK2 inhibitors or combination of hypomethylating agent with the uh, venetoclax, that is BCL2 inhibitors? For, so the, uh, for accelerated and blastic phase? Yeah. So the JAK inhibitors have no role in the decreasing the blast. We also know very well that the transformation to acute leukemia when you are on JAK inhibitor for chronic phase and you are enjoying the benefits of spleen and symptoms are not diminished at all. They're not increased, but they're not diminished. So we watch patients who are on JAK inhibitors for progression by looking at the blast, right? And see whether the blasts are going up. So that, that's, I think, very well established. So the role of the 10 milligrams twice a day of ruxolitinib in accelerated and blastic phase on top of hypomethylation agents or on top of chemotherapy is only to have this underlying control of the symptoms and the spleen to extend possible. And we don't modify that dose, we keep it steady because it's not contributing to myelosuppression. It's lower, but it's good for the quality of life. So no role for utilizing JAK inhibitors alone in accelerated and blastic phase is adjunct to the hypomethylation agents or chemotherapy. Venetoclock is very good uh, question. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you uh, have uh, seen there was a meeting uh, just about two weeks ago here in Texas, Texas MPN meeting, and we had a lovely discussion about the role of venetoclax in accelerated or blastic phase uh, MPN. The summary is there is no role for venetoclax in accelerated or blastic phase MPN. All the studies with the venetoclax so far, and you can see this yourself, all the studies with venetoclax in acute myeloid leukemia excluded, excluded post-MPN acute myeloid leukemia patients on purpose because the BCLX cell is the uh, predominant uh, factor in the MPN and the accelerated blastic phase MPN, not BCL2, not BCL2. So that's why all the studies excluded post-MPN AML. And now you have a clinical results, which were presented by us, our own 29 patients that were I would say at the moment, uh, looking retrospectively, unfortunately, included in all of the studies that we ran on our own with venetoclax combinations, and we did not know very well that information. We have experienced that the addition of venetoclax to hypomethylation agents or chemotherapy or even uh, other investigational approaches do not provide or does not provide any extraordinary benefit. What happens with venetoclax in post-MPN AML? Much more myelosuppression for much longer period of time many more hospitalization and increased death rate after two months. So we as a group say, and Dr. Contagion, my boss, finally accepted that when I showed him the data, do not use venetoclax in post-MPN AML. Thank you very much. A question from Dr. Shehzad, he's a transplanter at Kaiti Adam International Hospital. He asked about post, uh, in primary myelofibrosis, do you recommend any post-transplant JAK2 inhibitor usage? that is ruxolitinib after transplant? No, no, not for the control of the disease. None of these JAK inhibitors are specific for the JAK2 mutation. We don't have a JAK2 mutation specific drug. That's why for use of JAK inhibitors in MPN, you don't really need to know what the genetic uh, information of the patient is, right? Is it called reticulin, MIPL or whatever it is, doesn't really matter. The chance of response for spleen and symptoms is the same. The only role for ruxolitinib as we know and the doctor knows very well, is for therapy of GVHD, but not for prevention of relapse, or if the relapse is happening, to give it to eliminate the malignant colon. It's not going to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, any of the panelists want to have any question? I've got uh, some questions. Uh, Serge, uh, what particular cutoff uh, value of plate that would you recommend for escalating the dose of Rosutin app? in myelofibrosis that is associated with thrombocytopenia? Uh, so the question is about thrombocytopenia and when to use ruxolitinib? No, the thrombocytopenia induced by ruxolitinib in a patient who, who okay. in which we want to escalate the dose 
but uh, the pledge ad count is decreasing. At what cut of value would you allow us to increase the dose of rosutin ad? So I have to put a disclaimer because the guidelines are the guidelines, right? You have the explanation of when and how you should be decreasing the ruxolitinib based on the numbers, but experience in the clinic is quite different. We are all hematologists. So I'm not worried if the platelets are below 50 and I'm not stopping ruxolitinib at that point in time. To really answer your question, uh, you would need to look at the, the degree and the rapidity of the decrease in the platelets. So, for example, if the platelets are um, 88 at the beginning, I would start with 10 milligrams twice a day rather than five. Let's say you start with five because the platelets are below 100. After one month at five, there are 77. I go up to 10, right? The guidelines would say don't go up because the, they're, they're low. Uh, I would go up to 10 and platelets may go to 55 and I would even go to 15 after another month and the platelets may be 40 and I'm fine with that because I feel comfortable with 40 and patients being on 15 milligrams twice a day because the 15 milligrams twice a day will de reduce the spleen much more and patients will, will live longer. I want patients not only to feel better and have a lower spleen, I want them to live longer. So if the, the trajectory of the spleen decrease is very slow, I'm going up. If the trajectory is very rapid, you start at five and they go from 88 to 55 within three weeks, I'm not gonna go on a higher dose because the drop is so high. So it is really an uh, individualized approach. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, there is another question that, uh, what is the role of splenectomy pre-transplant in myelofibrosis? Is there any role, would you uh, recommend splenectomy if a patient has got, uh, say, a huge splenomegaly? Uh, the, so the question is how huge is a huge, right? Uh, in general, our transplanters here uh, say that in general, there is no role splenectomy. They have not published their own uh, uh, analysis of that over the last 10 years, but whenever I ask the same question, I don't do the transplant myself, but I work with Dr. Popat here. We are kind of, uh, you know, two sides of the coin. I do the medical care and he does the transplant. In general, the splenectomy is not indicated, but in exceptional cases when the spleen is huge. Well, how huge, I don't know, but it is individualized. And I tell you, it's not often done. I do the splenectomy uh, from medical standpoint sometimes. When I have a patient who has pancytopenia and I cannot give uh, any therapy, patient has low platelets and a transfusion dependent, huge spleen, what do I do? Splenectomy, and then the numbers go up and then I can treat with JAK inhibitors, right? Or patients on JAK inhibitors develop pancytopenia after two, three years of therapy, they still have a very good quality of life, but developing the very big spleen and I am taking it out while they are on JAK inhibitors and then I up the dose. So it, it, it has a role, it's not as prominent and, and much less than before. So that, that's my explanation of it. And moving on to the, the simplest thing, the, the polycythemia, uh, a patient, a low risk patient who is on simple phlebotomies if they develop symptomatic RN deficiency, would you recommend the, uh, say, going to the, the drug therapy or, uh, I mean, would you recommend uh, RN supplements, cautious introduction of RN supplements? Yes, I would uh, definitely uh, worry about the quality of life. You know, this is a lifelong condition. And so to have a patient suffer from the side effects from iron deficiency, uh, at the expense of having normal counts uh, doesn't really make sense to me. I would probably cautiously introduce the iron, advise the patient uh, and my staff that there will be increase in the uh, need for phlebotomy, right? Because uh, iron is basically driving the erythropoiesis and consider in uh, some cases introduction of site reductive therapy. Because if the phlebotomy need goes high, sky high, Nobody is going to be happy. The patient will feel better, but will have to come back often. So introduction of cytoreductive therapy makes sense to counteract a need for iron that would be improving the quality of life. And that uh, I understand that the, you mentioned as the white cell count, rising white cell count is also a risk factor for thrombosis. At what particular level would you go for the introduction of cytoreductive therapy in polycythemia? 
Uh, is there any cut off value or just rising? I mean, the speed of increase, it's the rate of increase or the absolute number of white cell count? Uh, so, I interact with many colleagues around the globe and in Quebec, in Canada, they say 25 is the cutoff. If you are 24, no. If you are 26, yes. And I say, why? Because it has to be, like I was explaining also and answering the question about the platelets, it has to be a combination of the rapidity, how quickly it goes up, and whether it's stable, and, and then the number as well. So if the number is going up 20, 25, 30, I don't feel comfortable at that level in a, in a 40 year old that has a, a controlled hematocrit with phlebotomies, no phlebotomies at all, but the white cell count goes from 15 to 20 to 25 within a year, that's too many. But if the number is steady at 18 or 22 all the time, and I inherit the patients with this number, and I know these are stable numbers for two years, I said, that's fine. So it has to be individualized, right? It's also a time frame and how high it goes. So I'm sorry, I can't give you the number. So thank you very much, Serge. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Salim Ahmed Khan. Thank you very much, Dr. Usman. Um, I, on the behalf of Pakistan Society of Hematology, I express my greatest attitude, uh, gratitude to all the panelists for sparing their precious time and for educating us. And it would be definitely helpful for our patients in the end. So for concluding remarks, I request President Pakistan Society of Hematology, uh, Jennifer Reyes Ahmed, for giving the concluding remarks. Thank you very much, everybody, especially uh, Serge from all, from all the way from Houston. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much uh, for joining us, Dr. Salim and Dr. Osman. Over thank to you, Jennifer. everybody. Thank you, Marine. Uh, as we know, this was the third PSH webinar and the topic we selected was MPM. This is a challenging topic, and not only for the diagnosis, but uh, it's, it's very challenging to manage these cases. And uh, we had the experts who, who uh, deliberated upon the diagnosis, risk stratification, and the management of MPN. Uh, as we know, all these aspects are challenging because of the various overlapping syndromes in the MPN group. And uh, I'm grateful to the, to the presenters for, for sparing their time, especially uh, the surge who, who has spare time in the early morning, maybe at seven o'clock probably at, at Houston now. And uh, we wish you uh, and all the panelists as well as the, the listeners a uh, happy weekend. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Serge. We'll continue asking you questions by email. Yes, please. That's, that's why the email is there. Always happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening.